Brian Stan with us on the Anakin Florian podcast. One thing that is missed in the lead up to Khabib and Connor is your analysis. So I want to get a little bit of it here. I think there are so many angles at which you can attack this thing, right? But among them, I mean, what are you most interested to see in what at least on paper looks to a lot of people like a classic striker versus grappler confrontation? It, it does, and I would say that it goes a little, a little beyond that in terms of, uh, you know, conditioning. The, the conditioning is going to be a big factor this contest as well, and and not just you know everybody knows that in the first two rounds is when Connor's going to be the most dangerous to beat Khabib, and we saw Khabib very susceptible to straight left hands when he fought Michael Johnson. He ate a number of them. He doesn't move his head real well. How fast? Will Khabib want to close the distance and get in on Connor's legs? And if he chooses that route, how well will Connor maintain his energy? Because we know if anything tires Connor out, uh, it's wrestling. And he comes in in great condition, but just because of the way he's built as an athlete, he's not a guy who's going to be conditioned to where he can wrestle for five straight rounds. He's just not going to be able to. He's got to keep his right. distance. He's got to land big left hands. And he's got to hurt Khabib early, but he's got to be smart about how he expends his energy. And, and he does have the power to knock Khabib out. We've seen Khabib get rocked. He's a human being. For, for Khabib, you know, for me, he needs to move his head. And he doesn't need to go in there and try and prove that he can strike with Connor. He needs to use his bread and butter. He needs to be able to get him down. What I'm watching for, when I've seen Khabib grapple, in my eyes, he is the best at controlling someone on the ground with one hand and being able to punch almost continuously with the other hand. That is so hard to do. When you're grappling with good guys at this level, the championship level, you got to use two hands to control them. And, and Connor can grapple. People forget right. that the kid can grapple. He's good on the ground. He's a big, strong guy. Can Khabib control him with one arm and land sufficient shots with the other arm before a referee wants to stand him up? Because if I'm Connor and I want to manage my energy, if I do get taken down early, I want to tie Khabib up. I want to make it boring and force them to stand me back up rather than expend the energy myself. I have to wall walk and work my way back up. I don't right. want to have to do that because it's going to, it will reduce my punching power over time. Michael Bisping used to employ a great strategy where he would shoot takedowns on guys. Even if he didn't land them, he would force you to defend them and he would steal your punching power. He did it to me. He did it to Vanderlei. He did it in a lot of his fights where he would make you wrestle and he would use his pace as a weapon to slow you down in the later rounds and take away your punching power because for him, he could punch the same power for all of those rounds. You know, Khabib has got to be smart, close the distance, get this kid down and wear him out over the first two rounds, and then, you know, look to be dominant in the third, fourth, and fifth. For Connor, I want to see, you know, can can he land the big left? Can he move and avoid the takedown early? And then can he manage his energy efficiently so he doesn't fade in the later rounds if he can't knock this kid out in the first two? Right. So if someone's giving you a thousand bucks to to bet on one side of this, Khabib's the favorite right now, about minus one seventy. Conor McGregor holding at plus one forty. Uh, do you have a lean here? Twelve days out. I do. I, I'm I'm leaning versus Khabib, and and you know, all, forget all the things I said. This game is very much about mentality, and and I look. I have not been around either fighter for some time, so I have no idea where they are. But I'm going to make my best educated guess. When you've made north of $100 million, your, your level of hunger, the, the level you're willing to go to um, to suffer to win a fight is different than a kid who's maybe got 50 grand in the bank from Dagestan. Could be made right. more money than right. that in the bank. But, but that's a different yeah. level, man. This, this, this kid comes from a place, it's different, but similar to the place that Connor came from, too. Connor came from a hard upbringing. It wasn't easy, right? He was trying to be a plumber and couldn't make it as such. Came from a blue-collar family and he was hungry. That's where Khabib is now. And, and he's going to be more primal. I think he's going to be willing to go to a certain depth of exhaustion and pain to win this fight. And Connor is tough as they come as well. I don't know if he's willing to go that far now having lived so comfortably for the last year. Hunger is a big, is a big part of these big fights. And yeah. I, I give the advantage to Khabib there. And I think that He's able to, to out-wrestle Connor early, wear him down, and as Connor begins to fade a little bit, he doesn't fade much, but we saw it a little bit in the Nate Diaz fights, Khabib takes over there. And it sounds like you don't at all worry about the big fight atmosphere for Khabib Nurmagomedov. If anything, it sounds like you think he might be buoyed by it, or I, I just think this is a different walk than he will have ever experienced prior. And you make a phenomenal point. And, and the one thing, I said this to somebody this weekend, you know, I said, look, on paper and as I analyze the fight, 
I think that Khabib wins this fight, but I can never count out Connor when the lights shine brightest. The kid just shows up. He just shows up, but I can't forget that first Nate Diaz fight. Yeah. I can't forget. You know, he is a human being. The kid is human. And, and this is a, a guy in Khabib Nurmagomedov that, in my eyes, some of the things that hurt him against Nate Diaz, Khabib is a little better at. Right. Very interesting stuff, Brian Stan. Great stuff. Continued success, my friend. Thanks for hopping on with us. Happy birthday. Anytime, brother. Break I some miss bread you. With, uh, I miss you too, man. And hey, if you ever want to call live sporting events, you know, we'll leave the light on for you, right? Motel leave, 6. Leave Get back Please in the do. saddle. Awesome. My pleasure. All right. Thank you, buddy. Thanks, there brother. he is. Former UFC commentator, UFC veteran Brian Stan with us here on the Anakin Florian Podcast. It's now time to take a stand with the All-American Brian Stan. On the Anik and Florian podcast. And joining us on what is his 38th birthday, the greatest living American, Brian Stan. Happy birthday, my man. You don't strike me as a guy who loves birthdays, but we wish you a very happy 38th. Yeah, I appreciate it, buddy. Yeah, I'll be, uh, you know, I don't remember the last time I celebrated one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I should actually start. Maybe for two years, celebrate them before I hit the big 4 0. And then I officially become old, I guess. It's true, because I just turned 40, and I I hate birthdays to begin with, right? And 40 was a tough one, man. Like, there was nothing easy about it. You really feel old, and I appreciate you not mincing your words there and telling me how old I am. You also don't strike me as a guy who would respond too well to a surprise party, like if all of a sudden (laughs) uh, there was a surprise party tonight. So hopefully nobody has one in the works for you. Yeah, well, I can tell you, there's there's no way it hasn't been the works for me. I'm going home to the next <laughs> hour. So, <laughs> uh, so uh, that, that, won't, that won't be part the of the impetus. Part of the impetus for getting you on today was to talk about Khabib and Connor. It's also, of course, your birthday, but it has been over a year, just over a year, since you called your last UFC fight. So, I just want to start there. I'm sure at times you're too busy to miss it, but at other times, maybe when you're sitting around watching a fight, you sort of wish you were, you know, still in the game. Oh, absolutely. You know, I mean, it's, um, yeah, there, there's been conversations here or there. Could I fit it in? Could I do this? Could I do that? It, it's really tough. You know, my current role, um, I, I am extremely busy. But, man, you can't help but miss a job like that. I, I mean, there is no there is no doubt. I think everybody around me, everybody who heard me call fights knew it, that I absolutely loved it. You know, at the end of the day, it was, it was pulling me away from my family. I was traveling a little too much and, uh, you know, it, it, it didn't. The, the switch to a new job really didn't matter in that regard. But looking back on it now, you never want to close the door completely. You know, I'm only 38. You, you never know what could happen. And maybe four or five years from now, I, I'd like to go back to doing some television. I, I definitely miss it. Love doing the job. And, and really, of course, you know, miss working with you. You and I had, you know, an awesome chemistry. We had a lot of fun exploring these different countries we went to. We made a lot of close friends with these fighters and coaches. And so, it was, it was a great environment, man. I had, I had a good time. It was like family. When I left that role, it was like leaving a piece of family, man. That was tough. Yeah. No, it is. And I know you called one by one a lot of members of the staff, and I know they appreciated that. And a show doesn't go by where someone isn't asking me about you, so there's no denying the impact that you made. How close are you to the sport in terms of following the day-to-day headlines? Like when this whole Jackson Wink MMA thing starts to bubble and Donald Cerrone and Diego Sanchez are getting into it and, and the Mike Winklejohn backdrop, I mean, I'd imagine a headline like that at least still crosses the COO's desk. I would tell you that I, I tend to, on, on a lunch break or at night, I will look at the, the major websites every day. I mean, you yeah. can't help, like, that's still a big part of me, right? I mean, I'm, I'm forever going to be a martial artist. And I'm a huge Eagles fan, but I'm, I'm a huge mixed martial arts fan. And so when I have the time and I'm trying to consume that, and watch those fights. So it definitely hit me. Um, I think that that was a situation that was brewing for a long time. You know, the, the minute the minute the BMF ranch opened up and even even before then, when when Cowboy and Leonard Garcia started making money on opening up their home to other fighters, they, it was a great business idea. They, they bought a – Cowboy bought a bus, and he would bus in all these fighters who paid a certain amount of money to stay at his place every month, and he would give Greg Jackson a piece of it. I mean, it was a great value yeah. proposition for him. He made a ton of money doing it, and that really led to what was the creation of the BMF Ranch, and there was going to be some divide there, and I see both sides of it. One thing I would tell you is that coaching fighters is really tough to be profitable. 
because when they lose, it's always somebody else's fault. So they leave the gym. Um, they don't pay very well or they don't pay on time. You know, you got to get a hassle them to pay the money that they owe you for the percentage of their purse. So it was really tricky. And I would tell you that Greg Jackson uh, is a sweet person. He's a very good coach. He's a great guy. And one of the things he's not good at is telling fighters like, hey, you owe me money. So it was never important yeah. to him. So, you know, when it came to actually running a profitable gym, that wasn't his strength. His strength was coaching fighters. So Wink watched that and said, look, I'm going to, we're going to move it to my building. I've got bills to pay. So I, I kind of understand both sides. It just crushes me that they can't sit down and come to an agreement because regardless whether Cowboys, you know, help that gym be profitable or, or not on a balance sheet or an income statement, he damn sure has helped build some of the fighters that have been there that, that have. Right, whether he's right. training with them, he's teaching him. Certainly helped me while I was training. So it's it's hard to see a guy who I consider like a brother, and then my coach, you know, Greg and, and Wink was really, you know, my, my main guy. I, I hate seeing that divorce there because, and I want to take both sides. I wish I could get them on a table and get them to come to an agreement right. because they have both contributed so much to that team. Um, and it does sting to see, you know, Cowboy not chosen over another athlete to coach. You know, when when he's getting ready to fight, that that's wild. Right. And I, I'd imagine you would not be one of those lining up to see Cowboy Cerrone and Diego Sanchez settle this inside the octagon right at this stage Hell of their no. respective no, careers, no you way. know? If, if, right. <laughs> and if I, would, if I were still training there, this, this conversation would have happened around a round table like this before it ever hit the media, yeah. and we would have tried to solve it that way. Um, it's the same way that a, a Joey Villasenor or Keith Jardine, when they were leading that gym, would have done it. But, uh, you know, it, it's tough. It, it's a tough, tough situation.